next week is Happy Valentine's Day, right? Man, you're excited, aren't you? You get to shop. Right, men? They're like, yeah, we got to shop. Go ahead and turn me down a little bit, Craig. That'd be awesome. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, Valentine's Day is coming up. So I figure, I, I really believe God wants me to talk about love. And I think it can knock out the meaning of love in 25 minutes. Right? Yeah. Yeah, go for it. Thanks. Uh, I, actually, um, Valentine's Day is coming up, and definitely I really believe God wants me to talk about love this morning, but maybe not so much um, traditionally the way love is talked about, but maybe a little bit of a different angle, um, a little bit of a, of a different aspect about love that hopefully will help us out to know exactly what godly love is and how much God loves us and how he loves us and how he wants us to love other people. Um, your heart and your mind, they are supposed to work together. And sometimes she's laughing already. <laughs> sometimes they don't, right? We're supposed to show love to other people, especially in the kind of decisions that we make. Um, our emotions, they really tend to lead us. But is that really what is supposed to lead us in our decisions about love? When you love somebody, buddy, whether it's a spouse or a family member or a friend, you're, and you're trying to show them God's love, um, or even like the strangers, people you don't know, how you make your decisions and what you do in front of them and what you do for them are super extremely important. I'm going to break it down in two different measures. One of them is heart and emotions. Uh, by the way, the title, I really struggled with this title. <laughs> I'm just going to follow my heart, right? So do we make decisions just from the heart? And can we trust those decisions if it's really just based on feelings and emotion? Um, so it's like following your heart really the best way to make those decisions. And how do you show that love for other people? And then there's your mind and wisdom, you know, the knowledge that you have of God's word. Do we make decisions based on just our mind, just on our thoughts, you know, our intellect, without those emotions? Um, how does God's word lead us in making decisions and how we're supposed to love others around us because of those decisions? And the last question is, how do we fill our hearts with and how does that affect what comes out of our words and our actions and showing love to others? So we've heard lots of songs about love. There's every song, probably 99% of the songs is about love. Um, like, uh, this is an old one, Mike will know it. Remember, uh, what is love? Baby, don't hurt me, don't hurt me, remember that? And if anybody named the, the singer? Hadaway. Hadaway. Yeah, Mike, I knew it. Uh, how about, uh, I wonder, wonder, who wrote the book of love? Right, right. It's like, who? Um, and then one of my favorite songs, actually, back in the 80s. Um, I want to know what love is. Anybody? Foreigner? Right, right. Of course, that epic song, Love Stinks. <laughs> Jay Giles Band. There you go. Boom. Thank you. Anybody seen The Wedding Singer? <laughs> you remember that? I love that. Okay. But this is what God says about love. This is how he defines it. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. And I know you've heard this before. If you haven't, I'll read it. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. It never loses faith. It's always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. I'm going to pray for a moment. Father God, I just thank you that we can hear your word and it just goes right into our heart. I thank you, Lord, that we get the definite meaning of what you're trying to tell us. I thank you, Lord, that we can just use your word today to just go out and love each other the way you want us to love. In the name of Jesus, and we all said, Amen. Amen. Uh, when you see a symbol that means love, what do you guys usually see out in the world, right? The heart. And the text message is, you know, I heart you, right? I love you. Um, and you see those things all the time. Somehow the heart has come to represent love. 
And like we talked about some songs out there, but there is um, there's a lot of sayings about the heart and how the heart is supposed to direct what love is. I'm going to say a few more things to see here about this. Um, the world gives the heart a lot of power. Um, if you guys have heard these sayings before, just be uh, true to your heart. That's another song, right? Uh, listen to your heart. The heart never lies. The heart has a mind of its own. Just ask your heart. My heart takes over. And there's a song that's kind of popular out right now, Demi Lovato, and it's called, anybody? Heart wants what the heart wants. <laughs> I think I heard Jada say that, right? Somebody said that over here. Yeah, so, so the heart has a lot of power. The world really just gives, the, the world gives the heart a lot of power. We're supposed to be true to our heart, listen to our heart, and follow our heart, and just, you know, just, has anybody ever told you, you know, when you don't know what to do, just go with the feelings in your Jesus. heart, right? Heart. Can we really trust the heart with making decisions? The heart is so full of emotions and, and feelings and passion and these spontaneous acts that we do. And at the same time, it has a lot of, you get anger and you get offended and you get resentment. And sometimes when you go by those emotions, that can lead to some really poor judgment in what we do. And the list goes on and on. So I'm going to read 1 Corinthians again, 13, 4 through 7, again, one more time in the message. And I'll do this once in a while in the message because it really just kind of hits home with a little more contemporary verbiage. If I give everything I own to the poor and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr but don't have love, I've gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say, what I believe, and what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. Listen to this. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut. It doesn't have a swelled head. It doesn't force itself on others. Love isn't always me first. Here's a big one. Love doesn't just fly off the handle. It doesn't keep score of the sins of others. It doesn't revel when others are groveling. It takes pleasure in the flower, flowering of truth. It puts up with anything. It trusts God always. It always looks for the best. Love never looks back, but keeps going to the end. There is a lot in this world that can discourage us. But we can decide with God's love that we can move forward. See, love can't just be emotions and feelings of your heart only. And it kind of tends to be that way a lot of times. It must have wisdom. It must have the knowledge of God's word to help guide us and direct us as we kind of go through all these different types of relationships we have, whether it's a, a spouse or a friend or just even somebody you just met. Some of the worst decisions I've ever made in my life were just spontaneous emotion. Without even thought. Just these quick emotional reactions. The things that have happened around me. And I'm going to be really open and honest and very transparent. Um, earlier this week, my wife and I got into a pretty big argument. You know, it seems like every few months married couples just get in these arguments. And uh, I guess we'd rather call it very intense fellowship. All right. <laughs> You know, what's a better way to say it? Just, we were ministering to each other very strongly and passionately. But we got in this big fight. But it wasn't, it wasn't, um, <laughs> it was just these stupid things that somehow when, you, when you're a couple, they build up. And after a while, it just kind of comes out in just this passionate, emotional way. And uh, during that time, you, you say things and you think things and you, you get a little bit out of what you know to be wise and especially with your words. And um, when, you, when you let that happen, when you let your emotions kind of get the best of you, you don't pause and you don't blend those emotions, which are okay to have emotions and feelings. But when you don't blend it with God's word, the emotions take over and God's word and wisdom just goes out the window. And that is when you get into trouble. It's crazy when you're in this emotional state, the thoughts that can go through your head. When you make decisions and you say or do something just strictly out of the, these emotions and feelings only, you can really get in a lot of trouble. I'm at the point in my relationship with God that um, I'm not really enslaved just to the emotions like I used to be. These thoughts that run through my head, I can pull back and go, whoa, whoa, that is so not godly. And I used to not be able to do that. It used to just grow and build and get out of control. 
See, we can say, I will show love and decide, and that's a big word, I can decide to love this person because it's the right and godly wise thing to do. It is the wise decision. I will be led by the Holy Spirit and not just my feelings that can change by and through our circumstances. If we let the circumstances dictate what our decisions are, then we're in trouble with our emotions. I have made a commitment to God that I will love people the way He wants me to according to His Word and not according to the way even that the world defines love. The world defines love completely different nowadays. And maybe there was a different time when the world was better at it. But it is not, it's not really the way God defines love. See, the world says that love is disposable. Love can come and go. If the honeymoon is over, you just start again. If you don't feel the same way you did, feel the same way you did, you can just fall right out of love. So there goes that word, decide. You can have these irreconcilable differences. You can just not see things the way you used to, so therefore you don't feel the way you used to, so therefore you feel like you need to move on. And you just grew apart, maybe. Then you just stop loving. This is very personal, but I'll tell you straight up, because that's what I want to be. If Debbie and I followed those feelings that we've had in our past, <clears throat> we wouldn't be here right now. If we had let the emotions and those things that come up upon you and those thoughts that you think about giving up, and you throw the godly wisdom out, we would not be here. We would have given up several times. What I need to do as a godly husband and father, son and friend, is that I must always take and apply God's word as priority, priority over my decisions and not just my raw feelings and emotions. That can cause me to make these rash and damaging decisions that are made without God's wisdom. Here's a really strong word about the heart in God's word. Jeremiah 17, 9 through 10. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine these secret motives. I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. See, what Jeremiah is saying is that your heart is your inner self, the inner part of you that thinks and feels and makes decisions, and how you act is dictated by leading with your heart. What you do in this pure emotional and this feeling, and if it's strictly coming out of your heart with no God's wisdom, it can be misleading and deceitful. I'm going to give you a highlight, something to circle. Our decisions are to be made, are to be made with wisdom. Right decision making according to God's will. A wisdom that frames and guides our emotions and our feelings. Now I'm going to read that one more time. A wisdom that frames and guides our emotions and, emotions and feelings. That is called discernment. A godly decision making when you allow yourself, heart, mind, and soul to be led by the Holy Spirit. And how do we help ourselves have this discernment or this godly decision making? How do we overcome these false leadings of our heart? How do we, how do we trust our heart and make decisions that are not made out of these raw emotions and feelings? We need to follow godly wisdom. We can't make decisions only out of emotion, especially when you're in a relationship. Anybody been in a relationship? I know what I'm talking about. Your emotions get the best of you. And I'm not talking about just a spouse or somebody you love. I mean, I'm talking uh, a daughter to a, a, a father, a mother, or a, a friend to a best friend. See, when you love somebody, you know, true love is about your commitment. A commitment, not your feeling. It's not just about your emotional decisions. I almost said love, true love. Remember that one? 
Somebody help me out. What movie is that? Love, too, love. It's what brings us together. See, here's the thing. Here's another highlight for you. See, we got to be careful. We shouldn't say, I feel, therefore I'm going to make these decisions. We should be saying, with God, I believe. I know. Therefore, I'm going to make this decision. Proverbs 14.33. Wisdom rests in the heart of the one who has understanding. But in the hearts of fools, it is made known. See, I don't want to make foolish decisions because I didn't use God's wisdom in my heart. And 1 Kings 8.61 says, Let your heart therefore be wholly devoted to the Lord our God, to walk in His statutes and to keep His commandments as of this day. Knowing His word is one thing, but walking it out is something completely different. Lots of people know the word, but when they don't walk it out, then they're just led by emotions and not the wisdom of God. See, there's another highlight for you. How many times do you think you've been tested in certain situations where you know, <laughs> where you know, you know you're in the situation and all of a sudden your emotions start kind of building and you want to react, but you kind of stop yourself and go, oh man, I think this is a test. It's like, I, I, I can't blow it right here. Think of a battery tester. A battery is put into a place where you're going to see if it's weak or if it's strong. Are you weak or strong in the way that you love others? Psalms 26, 2. Put me on trial, Lord, and cross-examine me. Test my motives and my heart. Boy. Something happened to me this week. And I'm going to tell you. You're going to put me on trial. I am. I'm going to test myself. That's where I'm going to start. With me. So, I get this letter in the mail, and it says, Hey, your car has been recalled. You need new airbags. I said, okay, cool. I call the dealer that will go nameless. Hey. <laughs> and it's not where my brother-in-law works. Hey. <laughs> I got to take my car in. Great, we'll make an appointment for you to come in and test it, make sure it's all good, and then we'll make an appointment for you after that to put the airbags in. And I go, why do I need two appointments? And the ladies, well, you know, it's just one of those things, we just have to make an appointment for you, and we, can you just can you give me your name and number, we'll make an appointment for you. And I said, you know, you kind of seem like you're in a hurry, you're kind of, you're kind of flustered, are you okay? She goes, I'm fine. I go, well, you just seem kind of flustered. I just want to make sure you're okay. She goes, oh, fine, fine, fine. She goes, can I, can I make your appointment? I said, sure. So I give the information. I make the appointment. And um, so because I needed two, they were going to check my car out. And they were, I was going to go down to the dealer, drop my car off, then make another appointment when they said, yep, you need airbags. It didn't make sense to me. So I go down a couple of days ago, and it's pouring rain. And I take off of work, you know, I, I, oh, yeah, I drop it off in the morning. My dad follows me in the car. We go all the way down to the dealership. And I, you know, my dad's waiting in the rain. I'm going to jump in. He's going to take me back home. And I jump into the car, go to work. And my day's kind of messed up. So I walk in, and, and the lady at the counter says, um, OK, great. Here's your letter. You got your letter, but we don't have your airbags. We can't put them in. You'll have to make another appointment when we get them in so that we can put the airbags. And I said, well, wait a minute. She made an appointment for me to come down here and I know I'm going long on this story, but I'm well enough already. So, so I said, well, wait, she told me I had to make another appointment. No, you don't need another appointment. You, just, you needed one appointment. You need the airbags. You need the airbags. And I said, well, that's what I told her. So I, and she goes, well, don't worry about it, sir. Just give me your name and number. We'll make you another appointment. And you can come in. We'll put your airbags in. Great. And it was really cool until then. I mean, I really was. I was standing there, and I went, I said, OK. And then I went, no, no. I go, I, this is exactly what I said. I said, no, this isn't right. I said, this isn't right. I go, she told me I needed two appointments. I took time off of work. I even told her over the phone it didn't make sense to me. My dad drove down with me. He's outside. It's raining. I, and now you're telling us we just have to turn around and go home after I told the girl over the phone. She goes, sir, I don't know what to tell you. 
But inside my mind, I was going, you're a pastor, you can't get mad. <laughs> you know, they may, like one of those stories I told, wanted to see if I practiced what I preached. You know, and, and I'm thinking the whole time, I gotta keep cool, I gotta keep cool. It's a test. But I said calmly, you know what, can I talk to a manager? I just, I just have to say that this can't happen. So I, she goes, well, his blah, blah, blah is in the uh, thing and I, in a manager's meeting. I can't say it. And, and I said, well, the girl, I'll just make up a name, Tiffany, said, <laughs> sorry, Tiffany, no, okay. <laughs> Tiffany, and she says, well, she doesn't really work in this department. You call that number, you may get somebody. I go, so, I go, wait a minute. So you're telling me that this girl, Tiffany's, she doesn't work here? She goes, no, she works here. I go, is she in this building? And she goes, yeah, she's in the building. And they're looking at me like, <laughs> okay, security. <laughs> He's going after Tiffany. <laughs> but I wasn't trying to come out like that. So I basically said, okay, I'm not, I just want to let you know that I just want to talk to the manager. So I, she, she goes, he's not available, he'll call you, I said, fine. But if anybody knows me, I start walking out, I pass one office, I get to the other office, there's this guy that's kind of looking at me as I'm walking by. And I went, oh man. I turn around, walk back in, I go, hey man, is there a manager available? I just got to talk to somebody. She so goes, all right, sir, no problem, okay, I get it. So he walks me to the customer relations, relationship manager's office, and I sit down, this lady's really nice, and I'm really super calm, I'm going, hey, look, I just want to tell you that um, this is what happened. And the reason why I'm telling you is for two reasons. Number one, I asked her, are you okay? Are you all right? Because over the phone, she seemed flustered. And the second reason is, there's tons of customers out there with cars that need new airbags. And if she's telling me the wrong thing, she's gonna tell somebody else the wrong thing. And that's really why I'm here. And you know, I, I work in customer service, I get it. I, I'm not mad or anything, it's, it's okay. I just wanna make sure nobody else is in this situation. And she looks at me really nice, because I really appreciate that. And, you're right, I don't want anybody else like you in here. <laughs> it's not really what she meant, but she meant she didn't want any other customers with wrong information coming in. And I shook her hand and I say thank you, and the lady I spoke to, she was really nice and pleasant. I just want to tell you, your whole team is really professional. And I really appreciate it, you guys. I just really wanted to make sure nobody else got the wrong information because it really was really inconvenient for me to take off of work, drive down here, have my dad waiting outside, and that's why I'm here. See, even us as Christians, that doesn't mean we accept injustice or wrong things. We're not doormats. We can be bold and be strong and stand up for righteousness. We just have to do it in a godly way. We have to do it in a way that inspires people that when I walked away, they go, you know, that guy was pretty calm. I, he's upset, but he's really nice. And she said, you know, you're really nice, sir. I really appreciate it. Next time you come in, we'll fill your gas tank up uh, just for out of our you know, appreciation. I said, well, thank you very much. Okay, and it was really cool. <laughs> that wasn't me a few years ago. <laughs> Debbie calls me five foot seven or the most intimidating person she's ever seen. <laughs> See, we want each other to speak in love. We really do. This is where the heart and the mind connect, because the whole time I was thinking about Galatians 5. Fits of wrath. Somebody's laughing. Galatians 5, right? Fruits of the Spirit and then the ways of the world. And the world is fits of wrath and anger and impulse. And that's where I used to be much more than I am now. So here's, here's something about where I want you to know where us as Christians are supposed to be in our boldness and our strength. The Apostle Paul was in Rome, and he was in prison. He had been in the city of Ephesus, which is kind of a port city on the west coast of Asia Minor, and he was writing a letter that was encyclical. It was supposed to be given to all the churches in the city of Ephesus. Paul wanted to let Christians know in every church God's intention for us, for the church body. He wanted us to express God's fullness and how we are to be united people, to empower us, to us for us to grow spiritually and, and maturity and in maturity, to make right, right decisions and show Jesus' love and have victory. He wanted Christians to speak to each other in love and in truth and have the spiritual wisdom. So in Ephesians 1:15, 17, and 18, he wrote this. 
Ever since I heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and the love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of all, our, of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. In the 18th verse it says, I pray that your hearts and minds will be flooded with light and that you can understand the confident hope that he's given for us to all those that he's called, his holy people who are rich in his glorious inheritance. See, it's a commitment to fill our hearts with God's word, that we'd, uh, we would allow God's word to just light up our hearts, to just flood us with his wisdom so that we can grow and have insight, not just in our relationship with God, but in our relationship with other people, so that we can love our fellow brothers and sisters and show that we're not impulsive, that we are led by God's wisdom, His Word. Luke, now I'm going to go really fast, lots of scripture here. Luke 6, 45, a good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. If it's void of the word, if it's void of wisdom, then you're just impulsive and just leading by your, by your fleshly feelings. Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. So how do you guard your heart? How do you fill your heart with that light that Paul was talking about? You've got to merge that godly wisdom with those feelings that he gave you, the feelings of love. Psalm 48-10 through 10. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Yes, your law is written within my heart. You guys are on it. Psalm 119, 9 through 6. This is really good, especially if you're like under 18, 19. Okay. How can a young person stay pure? By obeying your heart. I have tried hard to find you. Don't let me wander from your com commandments. I have hidden your word in my heart so I might not sin against you. I praise you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. I have recited aloud all the regulations that you've given us. I have rejoiced in your laws as much as in your riches. I will study your commandments, reflect on your ways, delight in your decrees, and I won't forget your word. Amen. See, it always comes back to are you reading, are you studying, are you memorizing? Are you applying God's word? It's that love letter that he gave us. In order for us to show love to others, whether it's spouses, children, parents, families, friends, people we just meet, strangers, we got to focus on, on things that will give us God's wisdom and love. And I'm going to read you two more verses that I think will reflect how we're supposed to show this love to others. Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. commandment. And secondly, and equally important, is that you must love your neighbor as yourself. That's with your heart, your soul, and all your mind. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on just these two commandments. Hebrews 8.10 but this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel in that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws, I will put my laws in their minds. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. That's how people are going to know us. God's really specific about the importance and our responsibility to love people around us with respect. Not abuse each other in any way. The fact that you want to love people unconditionally does not give others a right to abuse you or to mistreat you. That's where the wisdom comes in. To stand firm in that godly wisdom so that your emotions and when those decisions that you have come from a wise counsel from the Holy Spirit. John 13, 34 says, I will give you a new commandment. Love each other the way I have loved you. That's the way you should love each other. 1 John 3, 18 says, Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. So you need the love of Jesus just pouring out of you. That way you can love others, even the ones that have disappointed you and hurt you. You can make it through tough times where going by your feelings will only lead you down a broken path or wrong decisions. And I'm going I'm to close with this. So that bitterness and resentment 
that you have doesn't keep somebody else from serving God, from knowing God, that he's real and he's relevant. And especially that actions that we do might turn people away from God's mercy and salvation. We have a huge responsibility as Christians to control and check our emotions. God gave them to us, but he expects them for us to use wisdom in our decision making, in our relationships. Let's pray. Father God, I, first of all, I just want to thank you for your word. It's so awesome, Lord, that it's just your wise counsel, your Holy Spirit can come upon us and help us apply the word, not just be hearers, but doers of that word. Just be Christians in our actions and not just in our words, Father God. And I thank you for that. And I just thank you, Lord, that we can come together as um, your people and go out and take that love to others and take a breath when our emotions start to get the best of us, Lord, and apply your word. In Jesus' name, I pray. And we all said, Amen. Amen.